Right. And the power of a better tool. I'm I'm completely uh, I, I I'm not I'm not as luddite as I seem. I'm very happy. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I've been given a very interesting challenge, which is to pre present research that's not yet happened. So I'm going to do what I can for you um, to tell you what is going to happen, and hopefully to interest some of you in terms of, of participating and being part of that. So when I put in the text for this presentation, um, the design ideas function in PowerPoint actually seem to suggest that either I should have a heart or a stylized map of Africa. And somehow, <laughs> this is suggesting to me that this program perhaps knows more about the project than should actually be apparent without considerable spyware. And I start to wonder what kind of files it's putting together and trying to understand what it should present for me. Um, but let me start by telling you what I tell my students to never do, which is to start with what I'm not going to do. And I've already hinted a bit about that. I'm not going to offer you any conclusions today. None of those overgeneralized things that we academics have been rightfully accused of doing. Um, and I have the luxury of not doing that because, well, I don't have them yet. But it's also because our project just began in the field in actual fact last month. And if I look when I first got here a little bit like where am I and what day is it and why do I have to put on so many clothes, it's because I've actually been six weeks in Tanzania and have just come back uh, on Friday because we're really kicking off the project. And these are some funny pictures. We've discussed a lot. We have a 15 person team about um, appropriate use of, of visuals. So I'm afraid you won't yet get any of our actual field work pictures. And it's because we really feel that those are things we need to discuss, both with our team members, but also with our advisory board. Um, these we think are rather innocuous because, well, this is workshop stuff. A picture here is with my South coordinator, Dr. Dr. Opportuna Cueca, who is the, uh, in the Department of Geography. And at this meeting, this was one of the meetings that we had in the <laughs> in February. Someone on our team was talking about the difficulty, ethically speaking, of working in this realm, of going and trying to do research on people who are dealing with humanitarian crises. And what does it mean when you bring researchers into that mix? And I think that there are real concerns about that. And this is something which we take up from the beginning, because there's no reason to assume that just because people are local, somehow they don't have those same ethical dilemmas that anyone has in terms of working in these very difficult circumstances. And one of my collaborators said, which I said, I'm going to take that and put it on our website. Um, understanding is our response to the emergency. And I thought about that, and I thought, that is what we do as researchers, okay? What we do is we provide knowledge, we provide understanding of what's happening in different parts of the world from different perspectives, what different actors think this, these actions and events and practices actually mean. And in our project, we do that with a bias toward the global south, okay? A clear, explicit, ideological bias toward the global south. And one of the reasons is because we think it's important to shift the neo-colonial bias of including Southern voices, only of producers of gray literature, but not knowledge. I think you did a great job in terms of distinguishing those things. Uh, what Katya called the hardcore academic research, right? That's not usually where you see Southern authors at the forefront, and it should be, okay? What we need is also the importance of including other ways of understanding, other ways of asking the right questions, not just mining data for answers for things we think we already understand. And so that's one reason why we think it's very important that we've been able to have a long-term collaboration. This is a very long research project, five years. If I don't come back at the end of five years with some conclusions, with some conclusions then you should certainly hold me accountable for that. This comes from work that I've done, so I'll give you just a brief introduction to that. Um, I'm a political scientist, in spite of the fact that my current job is in the Department of Management, Society and Communications at the Business School. And I've been looking for a couple of decades now at issues of global politics and local bodies. So for me, the localization agenda is something which is very interesting. And I'm trying to understand the aspects which are new and the aspects which really relate to things which I've been studying uh, really since the mid 1990s, starting with issues of population politics, reproductive health and sexual rights in Tanzania, 
Um, this was the first very long-term project that I did working in and out for a decade where I spent about 25 months actually in Tanzania. Then I did research on the politics of access to antiretroviral drugs, looking at HIV AIDS and how people actually dealt with getting access to drugs and how AIDS affected their livelihoods. This was a comparative work in Uganda and South Africa, quite different places. Um, and from that, I moved into a place that some of my colleagues thought was a bit odd, uh, which was looking at celebrities. And I started looking at celebrities in North-South relations because it became very clear to me that who we think about as the locals and the globals are changing, that the new actors and alliances that are being called in to fund humanitarian and development research are changing, and they're also changing where our ideas come from. So not just where we get the money, but what we think and who's actually called upon to present the public with a humanitarian crisis, to bring attention, to actually use the profit making of the attention economy supposedly for good. And what does that mean? So I started looking at these celebrities, which involved work uh, for about a year in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I mentioned that I come from the business school. I work in what I call the aid business. I'm very interested in understanding different aspects <laughs> of aid as one of the actors as part of civil society, actually. Businesses are part of civil society. And so to understand global change, I think we have to understand the aid business. It's a bit of a shorthand that I use for different kinds of practices that actually make up humanitarian helping. Um, I think that helping itself has become a branded commodity. I think that humanitarian organizations that operate today very much have to operate as brands do. You all in this room know very well about the changing of financing infrastructures, which all levels of humanitarian and development organizations have had to deal with. I think that these are significant changes that we really need to understand. To understand particularly, also what does this mean for those who are involved in these helping relationships? Businesses have been new players in sort of key alliances for humanitarianism and development, although they have always been active in these local contexts that we're interested in. And so as a civil society actor, and as one that's intimately linked with elite power, but also with states and old school political power, I think it's a good place for political science to get involved looking at some of these issues. So what I'll talk to you about today is basically the bottom right hand corner, which is everyday humanitarianism. If you're interested in any of the other work that I do, please uh, feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to talk and share. If by any chance any of you are blocked behind academic paywalls and can't get access to some of this uh, hard literature, which has now become itself a very commoditized uh, uh, tradable in our field, I'll be very happy to send you a copy. And I know that's on tape and I'm just claiming I'm going to break the law, but that's how it goes. I will not send you the final copy, of course. So everyday humanitarianism. You might wonder where on earth we cooked up that idea. Actually, we cooked it up in a place quite far from Tanzania and quite far from the project in which it's currently involved. It actually came out of work I was doing on celebrities and celebrity humanitarianism. Uh, in 2016, we organized a conference at the London School of Economics together with a media and communication studies professor, looking particularly at the representations of humanitarianism about how it is people come to think about something as doing good, right? Particularly in an international realm. And so we, this hashtag everyday humanitarianism was, was the, what we called the conference, looking at the ethics of what this meant, affects, what kind of feelings and emotional responses were, were celebrities like Angelina Jolie that you see here trying to trigger and for what kinds of outcomes. And then practices. Our hypothesis is that this actually changes the actual workings of organizations like the ones that you're often involved in. And we want to understand what does that mean? What does it mean for what you have to do? How does it make your work more difficult or perhaps easier? So these are things which we actually we called an international conference, tried to get people working all over the world to find out what they were doing. So we, we published a, a special issue of a journal. This is a rather, I'm going to say this quietly, an obscurish journal. It's actually a journal of the American Political Science Association. So for political scientists, it's not very obscure, but for any people working outside of political science, it's really obscure. Um, 
But this is where we put these things together. And it was very interesting to us to find out what work was going on here. Again, I'm very happy to share this. I believe there's also a free link to the introduction uh, online on the journal website. And we were trying to introduce this term and to understand what it could be used for and what it couldn't be used for. Linking together and expanding on developments in this changing definition of what humanitarianism is coming to mean, basically linking to citizen practices. But the citizens that we looked at were primarily in donor countries. They were in the global north. We looked at consumers. We looked at businesses and philanthropists. We did look at diaspora organizations, but these were people who came from the south but then migrated to the north, right, with the infrastructure and the access to all sorts of, of possibilities that, that came with that. And so we were really trying to understand much more about what has changed with this everyday humanitarianism, because we're assuming that there is a certain ethics of altruism. Okay, and this is something that was interesting that came up a lot in the celebrity work. People were very interested in things like, you know, do you think that Brad Pitt really wants to do good in New Orleans? And I would say, well, I don't think there's any reason we should assume that Brad Pitt is, you know, any more malevolent than any of the rest of us, right? Most celebrities probably have a lot of mixed motivations. Incentive structures are quite diverse. That's really not the question we want to ask here. What we want to ask is, how does the restructuring of different forms of altruism, the fact that people, I think, want to do good. How does that change the actual good that is done? Okay, when we start to bring in people in different ways, not as citizens paying taxes, going to pay, you know, bilateral and multilateral aid, which is how most citizens participated in development humanitarianism in the past, but instead as people who, you know, buy the right clothes, right, or go to the right charity events. How does this change? And so these are some things that we started asking, looking at how it affects the professionalization as well of organizations that you have to suddenly have a brand and have a marketing strategy and have a celebrity liaison officer in ways that didn't happen in the past. Um, how does it affect marketization? What things sell? Okay, we don't like to think about that, but we all obviously do have to. And about mediatization. What does social media do? What does this proliferation of images do? And one thing which I'll get back to in our project is we've come to understand that it does a lot and we really need to take care with them. And that somehow simply having a code of contact or a series of guidelines is absolutely necessary and in no way sufficient. So we recognize very clearly that this work had a northern bias, that it was in many ways perpetuating the kinds of biases that a lot of my other work was trying to work against. And I thought, hmm, that's a bit ironic, right? Being called out by your own work for not doing what you say should be done. And I started talking about this uh, with some colleagues and particularly with some of my colleagues that I'd worked with a number of years ago in Tanzania and the ideas of everyday humanitarianism. And we started working through some of these ideas together. And they said, yeah, why don't we come and do this work in Tanzania? You know. Tanzanians are doing all these sorts of things. And I said, of course they are. Why would we assume they wouldn't be? And then we started talking about, yes, but we don't document those. We don't think about it. Um, we know, right, all of us, that humanitarian responses to disaster and poverty, to pandemics, um, yes, I just go back to Northern Italy, have been around since antiquity. We know that people have been responding, but the humanitarianism as a field has a very particular history and that this history has linked it directly to aid, directly to NGOs, and directly to certain kinds of specific humanitarian actors. What we're trying to do is to understand everyday humanitarianism as expanding this series of practices, okay, outside of the formal structures of humanitarian action. Okay? So we're trying to look at a do-gooding response to crisis, which can be proximate for your neighbor or distant for somebody that you don't even know across the globe. And we're trying to explore that, not just in a north-south perspective, but from taking a much more southern biased perspective. So the new contribution, you Katja very kindly pointed out that there are always gaps in research. And one of the things that was important for us, and frankly was important for anyone willing to fund a five-year project, and we thank very much uh, the Danish Development Research Council um, and, and the Danish Fellowship Center for funding this research for five years, is because it also makes a theoretical 
contribution. It contributes to new knowledge. First of all, <clears throat> it's synthesizing the acts of ordinary citizens, okay? Not just professional workers. And it's not that the work that professional workers does is not important, but it's that we simply have very little documentation of what ordinary citizens are actually doing. The second is that we're looking particularly with the Southern bias at the Southern context and not through the typical Mormon perspective, okay? We're not assuming that a certain thing is a humanitarian act. And we have some particular ideas about, it's very difficult to define, but about how we're gonna do that. And finally, which I think is quite unique, is that we're focusing much more explicitly on the givers, not just the receivers. Again, of course, the recipients are critical. Of course, the people who need help are critical. But our point is that they tend to be the only focus so far of research. We need to understand much more about who gives, why do they give, why do they sometimes choose not to give? And we need to do this at a very local level, because this is an area which we know is going to be and, and has always been critical to humanitarian responses. It's not just that it's going to be, it has been. We simply haven't understood it very well. So our project design, I have a few minutes, I'm going to bore you with the nerdy stuff. I hope that's okay. You have some coffee. Um, it, it's, it's basically looking at different levels of Tanzanian society, because it's so important, I think, when we think about local, to remember that we need to unpack that a lot. And it's very fascinating because we've had three large workshops so far in the South team. And a lot of our debates are about what do you mean by this? And I think it's very important. What do you mean by Tanzanian helpers? What do you mean by wealthy philanthropists, right? How wealthy you have to be to be included in that category. There are Tanzanians who own businesses who do extensive investment when crisis takes place. We need to understand more about how that works, not just Bill Gates as a philanthropist, Okay, but you know, say Mingi as a philanthropist, not a Tanzanian philanthropist. Um, we also want to understand the middle class contributors. And this is a very interesting, extremely contested area, trying to understand people who are not the wealthy philanthropists, but people who have their own livelihoods more or less stabilized, who also help in times of crisis. But what we also know, anecdotally, is that poor people tend to help other people a whole lot more than rich people. We don't usually think much about that, but it tends to be something that we know, no, not documented empirically or through this kind of social scientific evidence. But we do know in Tanzania that there are neighbors who help neighbors. For example, just basic things. When people are moving from a refugee crisis to uh, a center for, for receiving their papers, people will invite them in and cook a little bit more ugali and say, you know, have a meal. We don't usually think about that as humanitarian assistance. Why not? So these are the kinds of things that we're gonna look at in different areas of the country. We're gonna look at protracted crises, the ongoing crises. Tanzania has unfortunately been home to one of the longest uh, lasting refugee situations in the world. We're gonna look at whether or not people's responses to these protracted crises are different. Who helps, why they help? Do they still help after a time period? How does this shift over time? But then we're also going to look at acute crises. We're going to look at floods and earthquakes in particular. We're currently having a big debate in our team about whether we're going to look at locusts. Um, we hadn't planned to, but one thing we had planned to do is to have a rapid response research team to do exactly what we need to do. When a crisis comes up in this five-year period, to pay attention to it and to actually understand it in a way that's ethical, that doesn't come in and actually somehow uh, get in the way of the response. And so we're looking at different kinds of crises and different groups of helpers. We're also looking at these different kinds of givers because we think that it's going to be something where we need to understand. We're not assuming that the same kinds of dynamics are going to operate across the different levels or across the different kinds of crises. Distant given, for example, amongst elite philanthropists might actually give them away to define themselves as givers, being a middle-class person and being able to give, right, produces a certain kind of subjectivity. That's an academic thing, but it makes people participate as citizens in a different way. And we're open to those kinds of questions as well. So everyday humanitarianism will still be intersecting, intersecting with the formal structures. Um, you can see that local Red Cross office in Kigoma, which you can notice from that red couch, We've talked a lot about how much we will also be involved in political issues and in doing anthropologies of the state. 
and how to deal with the formal structures, which in Tanzania are not just international, but also national, regional, district level, local, down to the tin cell groups. Um, and so I also think a little bit about what I can tell you in an election year. Tanzania has elections coming up at the moment. We're doing field work and we won't be in the field during elections. And if you want to know more about that, you can ask me questions on the coffee break. What's really important to us is that we do consider the relationship between helping, which is highly re regulated, and also what people are able to do and what people mean and what they think these regulations mean for them. Um, I have some examples, which I'm just gonna skip because I'm on tape at the moment. But what I do want you to know overall is that it's extremely important to start also with the formalities of the law, Okay? because that is something which is very critical in Tanzania, but then to also understand how the relationships between national politics, international politics, donors at all levels actually come into this space. We can't just say there's informal space. There's always this interaction between the formal and the informal structures. I'm gonna move a little bit forward to that. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. This is the nerdy stuff. We have a conceptual aim, which is to talk about and define what is this concept and see if it's useful for something. Uh, I'm not the kind of academic who just develops concepts for concepts. I actually expect them to explain something. So if it doesn't explain anything at the end of the day, well, then it doesn't work. Empirically, we're gonna understand a whole lot more of what's going on in Tanzania. We have a 15 person team, we're working for five years. We will have a lot of on the ground documentation. And then policy wise, we're working particularly on Tanzania's disaster management and humanitarian assistance policies. These are new in the country. They are policies that various levels of government are struggling with. And we are trying very, very hard to embed in those policies, but also to support what's going on locally there and here. Institutions involved here are the University of Copenhagen, the Copenhagen Business School, Roskilde University, you mentioned the PhD, on local responses, and that's also Peter Carlin, who's my collaborator, who's head of the department. He's also on this project. Um, and the Lena School of Economics. At the University of Dar es Salaam, which I think is quite important, we have faculty of law. We actually have the law team who's interested in working as part of this project, because he thinks that disasters and humanitarian assistance are such an important issue for him. Uh, we have the Department of Political Science, which as you can imagine, for me and the policy interest that I have is critical. And we also have the Department of Geography, and one reason why we considered that it's important to embed ourselves in geography is because we are defining humanitarian disasters geographically, right? And this is difficult to do, but what we want to make sure is that we have something that we can defend as a bounded realm of everyday humanitarianism and that it's humanitarianism. It's not just normal charity, which people also engage in. So for us, if it takes place in, in the proximity both in time and geographical space of a disaster, then it's humanitarianism. And I understand that there are problems with that, but what we have to do is we have to be able to define what it is we're gonna study. Okay. I'm gonna skip through the objectives in the interest of time and just tell you a little bit about long-term impact. Okay. First of all, it's about the, the policy design. And the one thing which is an incredible strength of collaborating with extremely competent local researchers who are based institutionally at, you know, the most prestigious university in the country is that they already inform policy. They are already getting called to meetings in Dodoma on a regular basis to try to inform the government about what's going on. They're also regularly going to meet the Danish ambassador, to meet the American ambassador recently, and being pulled into these policy circles. And so what I see as my job as the PI, the project leader on this, is simply to be able to try to coordinate various parts of knowledge and information, and then they move forward this agenda which what they need from me is basically just to make sure we keep the research going. They're the ones who are absolutely in the best place to push forward the policy agenda and how we implement it in the best way. Um, we're also working toward implementing the need is the World 2030 in Tanzania and elsewhere. First thing we did when we started up last month was to go and meet the Danish ambassador, which was extremely useful because Denmark has a lot of interest in what's going on in Tanzania at the moment. Um, as you probably know, Tanzania is and has, has been forever a priority country for Danita. There is also a special friendship between the countries because of Tanzania's socialist past and commitment to democratic socialism. And so these are things which have gone through a period of, and there's still perhaps going through a period of tensions, but which are extremely important to both countries. This is an area which is absolutely critical for the collaboration. 
And then finally, of course, because we're researchers, we want to make sure that at the end of this, this experience makes us all able to do better research. So that's something that we will hope to get out of it. Um, we're particularly working on sustainable development goals. One, poverty. At the end of the day, I'm a development studies person. And that, for me, means that poverty really is something that we cannot say, oh, it's out of fashion. Oh, you now we think about other things. It's always there, it's always present, and it's always something we need to talk about, not just in the global south, but also in the global north. Um, the second is on peace, justice, and strong institutions, where we're working particularly with law for this reason. And then 10, reduced inequalities, which for me is intimately linked with poverty, which is why I live in a social democratic state. Leave it there. So, Asante Nisana, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. With this in campus to, to follow it. Um, you mentioned a coffee break. I don't think there will be one before you have to leave. Which I believe is around 11. 11:30. 11. 30. 11. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, we want to make sure that there is time for questions. And there are questions. That's probably fine. And how you'll keep on the time. Yeah. What would be the argument against including locals? I'm sorry again? What would be the argument against including locals? Okay. Yeah. Let's keep those two. And if you see any questions popping up, please be there. Okay. okay. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for good questions. And you know, Philip, I, I would love to show you our Gantt chart. Um, <laughs> because to, to be honest with you, what, what, what we've been doing in a lot of these workshops is, is not just figuring out about narrowing our focus, but figuring out really how to make the appropriate focus and who can do it and what we can do with the different skill sets that we all have. I mean, you all know about this, about running a team of 15 people. Um, we, and we have, we have four PhD students also who have independent projects. So the other thing is about coordinating the focus. We, we have the two by two in terms of the proximate and distant and the term and in terms of um, whether or not the causes are going to be you know, things which which are, are local, I'm sorry, which are which are protected or which are which are actually acute. Within that, we have chosen geographical regions, and so that's actually how we sort of we have to specify. So we're going to be working in in Kigoma, and we have actually a team which works particularly on that, which is also northern and southern collaborators, senior researchers, and PhD students as well. So I mean, I won't I won't bore you with the details of the names, but the point is that we we have a regional focus there. And this is because this is where we can work with camps and their communities. I mean, this is the, the area where we get most of the refugee camps and, and refugees also who live in, in uh, self-settled communities who are coming from Congo, who are coming from Burundi, and who are some of them coming from Rwanda. So that's one of the first side. The other is Morogoro, and that is because Morogoro has been an area which has become increasingly and regularly subjected to flooding and quite consistent flooding. And so there's a question about, you know, what, it, what does it mean? We have an acute situation, yet now we know every year we're starting to expect floods. So what began as in our dilemma as an acute situation might be, I think, at the end of five years, unfortunately, a protracted one. And so we'll, we'll be open to that. We have a team that works on that and basically works on the disaster side. They will also go and work up in Bukoba um, with, with earthquake issues as well. There has been a particular earthquake which has been documented and has had a lot of interesting um, relationships between the organization of giving and what is legal and supported versus what is uh, happening as well and trying to understand how that works. We can also study that because now we have a couple years distance from it. So we're going to look at that case. We're going to look in Dar es Salaam uh, where we're going to actually look at the flooding, which again, a little like Morogoro, used to be an occasional situation, has become a, an ongoing crisis. Dar es Salaam gives us the opportunity also to study local giving, but perhaps by wealthy philanthropists who themselves may literally see, which is something we, we know from our, our preliminary field work, um, people literally just sort of moving uphill when the waters come. 
And so then they move into other people's neighborhoods and people are then being required to take in um, other guests, whether or not they're family members or, or people they don't know because of the flooding. So we're doing geographical foci. We will be, however, also working, and this is a question about the locals, we will be also working in other places as crises come up. The reason not to include the locus, two. One, we can't everything. Um, and, and the difficulty is at this point, which has been fantastic, my colleagues are really into this and they're saying things like, you know, sometimes a car accident, like if it's a bus and a lot of people get killed, that could be a disaster. And we've discussed how that can absolutely be a disaster for people who are involved. But for us, we have to get some criteria about what kind of disaster we're actually studying. And so we actually have a database. And so it has to be registered as a disaster in Tanzania. And this is something that's also very important in terms of the kinds of responses it can allow. Once you register something nationally as a disaster, then you trigger a certain kind of response. And we're trying to understand, well, we know how that should work in theory with the way that the act should be implemented. We want to know a lot more about what that means in practice. Other thing about the locusts is that they're happening right now, and they're likely to continue happening later on this year. And that we think it's a really good time for our team to spend developing the tools. We're also doing a survey. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you too much about the methods. So we're doing interviews, of course, but we're also doing actually a, a quantitative survey, which will be representative of the areas where these disasters are occurring. And so we need to develop those tools now, uh, which is a good time, which means we will go primarily into the field beyond the preliminary studies after the elections have already taken place. Thanks very much. We'll take one I mean, the role, the role of religion is, is something we have very much considered, and that is something that will be part of our research. What we're trying to understand is how much we should also work with the organizations themselves, with the churches and the mosques and the temples, um, versus how much we should we should try to be sure we can catch that, as it were, in the survey. Of, you know, so when we ask people, you know, about their practices, you know, we talk about, you know, have you donated to your church? Right, these sorts of things. So we will definitely capture it in the survey when we're still in discussions about whether or not, and we can talk about you know whether or not we should actually just go and talk to them. I started doing that, frankly. We did some preliminary work. I was in Kigoma. You know, I just I went, you know, of course, I just sort of I, I went to the big the biggest church in Kigoma, which is a huge Catholic cathedral, and talked to them because they do have this kind of work. Um, to understand more about what you know what things are organized. Our difficulty for that methodologically is whether that really still falls into formal humanitarianism. Right, the organizational side, um, because we do know that in many places, in, in Tanzania in particular, it has really been the organization of the church and of the mosque. Now, that's one side of it. So that's a question for us. So we're, it's fun to say, well, you know, we don't know yet, but we're going to find out and we're going to you know, get the best way of working with it. What we do know from our preliminary research already is, of course, people talk about giving in their own particular religious community. And that's one of off the record examples because it's not yet part of our findings. Um, but there's a very wealthy philanthropist in a particular region where we're studying um, who does give money regularly to you know, members of his religious community. Now, for us, that doesn't disqualify it from being humanitarianism. And so there's also the question about this sort of formalization about does it have to be to someone you don't know? Does it have to be without any sort of of affiliation or you know family it's a very very difficult thing to get on the ground and so these are things that are fun because we think it's going to help us rethink about what it means to be a humanitarian at least we hope so thanks so okay. much thank you excellent thank you Any other questions? thanks so much and um, so we'll move on now and we'll welcome back to Catherine so again <laughs> and David Miller, and David is the portfolio manager for Syria and Iraq. 
And what you will be um, sharing with us uh, are some views and experiences from the ground. And we'll be going to different corners of the world, Syria, Horn of Africa, and Indonesia. And so we'll start. Yeah, and this is going to be like a really, really, um, I think it's just a taste of reports that we're going to give you. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, things are on computer because this is mine. <laughs> so basically, we're presenting uh, four reports, four reports in 20 minutes. Um, so that's, of course, very kind of fast and, and it's going to be very brief. Uh, let's see if it's coming. Yeah, that's a good start. And while it is downloading, <laughs> um, the report I'm going to talk about is called uh, Views from the Ground. It's a report that uh, was done and launched quite uh, recently. Uh, a report that looks at localization in the Horn of Africa. And it was done together with uh, uh, Tuck University. Uh, again, Kimberly Howe, who uh, I have to Yes. Good. This is the report. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, so this is a report that we developed um, called Use from the Ground, um, looking at localization in the whole of Africa. <coughs> it's, of course, very uh, sweeping, speaking of concluding uh, much on, on a relatively little um, basis. Um, we visited three different countries. We worked, um, you know, we asked in South Sudan, in Kenya, and in Somalia. Uh, we had around 52 interviews um, in the three countries. So you can imagine that it's not like super in depth in each country that we had a chance to kind of dive into that. Um, three different uh, researchers or um, who kind of jumped into each country. So we had Kitaka, um, he was uh, looking at South Sudan. And I think Kitaka is actually online now <laughs> too. Um, yeah, and he was part of that uh, research. Um, he was looking at South Sudan, and we had Hiro, who was part of the Kenya um, Kenya research. And then I was um, in Somalia and and doing the interviews there. What we wanted to do with this report um, was to understand the factors that enable and hinder local access from providing high quality, principled, and effective response from the perspective of local responders. And it's an important addition. Because as we talked about before, there can be an a bias with international organizations or with international perspectives. It was important for us to kind of have that conscious bias of getting the local voices out. Um, it's also not a coincidence that we want to look at high quality principled and effective response. Um, when we're discussing localization, when we're talking about localization, we're trying to understand localization and what it means to our organizations, the organizations we work with and the practice we do. These are the things that comes up over and over and over again. Um, assumptions like local access cannot provide high quality responses. The policy is basically just not good enough. Um, they can't be principled because of their attachment in the local environments that they're part of. Um, and it's not always um, as effective as we could maybe do it um, as international organizations. Effectiveness, however, also comes kind of with the other side of the coin, which is that it's very often perceived that local responses are more cost effective. So it's basically cheaper to do that um, than uh, when international organizations do it. So we wanted basically to look at those assumptions and try to see what could we find out there that could kind of help us understand better um, these assumptions in these three countries, how were they actually playing out in practice? So again, we did the 52 um, interviews, uh, 31 of them uh, with local responders and since I only have like less than five minutes for this report, uh, I'm not going to dive much into it other than say that uh, some of the main findings that we found um, was that um, that uh, in terms of capacity, which is one of the things that we were also looking at, we found that um, when we asked local responders about what it took to do a good response uh, that was uh, you know on time, that was appropriate, we got very different answers than when we asked them about, so what capacities do you need to do a humanitarian response? And it sounds as if we're asking about the same thing, but it was actually two different things we were asking about. Because it turned out that 
the way that many local responders have been talking about capacity was so influenced by what they have been asked to do and what they have been asked to focus on um, by very often international partners that they were working with, which were the usual stuff, uh, you know, uh, finance and uh, reporting and some of the technical matters. That, that would be the usual capacities that many international organizations would ask local organizations to do when working in partnerships. And they would, they would say that, yeah, yeah, capacity is that something with exactly finance, reporting, um, and technical capacities to carry out stuff. But when you then ask, so what does it actually take to do a response that's appropriate, that's timely, it was a different set of things that they were actually talking about, a different set of characteristics that they were referring to. And that was a quite interesting finding because it says something about how we are, um, how that whole kind of international, uh, international and national partnerships, how is that actually affecting how local organizations are adapting um, to international systems, which may not necessarily be to the, um, to the benefit, I guess, of what they actually see as, as a good response um, for, the, for the beneficiaries. So that was one of the main kind of big findings that we really thought was, uh, that was a surprise to us. We hadn't kind of seen that coming. Um, another thing around capacity was that um, it was found that capacity was something that or was perceived as something that INGOs chose to give to local organizations. And again, super interesting. I mean, you know, many of us, especially coming from, you know, the whole kind of Danish, Danish thinking about capacity, local organizations, civil societies, it has to be kind of locally owned processes. And here we basically have local organizations telling us that, well, you know, if the international NGOs, you know, if they wanted to give us capacity to strengthen their capacity, they could. Um, they're not doing it adequately. And that's, you know, almost like a, a conscious strategy not to do that, which is, you know, surprising because we were kind of, uh, we've been working for many years in the international community, I guess, or many of us have to kind of see these um, capacity strengthening processes locally rooted. And then we kind of figure out that it's something that we almost as, as charity <laughs> give give to somebody else. So that, that's how it's, it's perceived by many local organizations. That was a surprise to us and an interesting finding as well. Um, lastly, one thing that came up um, that we didn't ask about at all in our interview guide, actually, that was competition. And even if it wasn't part of our interview guide, every local responder would mention competition between international organizations and local organizations. This is for Somalia, by the way. That wasn't exactly the same for Kenya and South Sudan, but this was the case for Somalia. That was just super interesting because we, we, didn't, we didn't even ask about it. <laughs> but yet people will say, well, there's this huge issue with competition between, well, basically INGOs going for the same funds as we are uh, as local organizations. And most of them actually found that competition should be super unfair because the international NGOs had much more strength behind them in terms of proposal writers and a whole kind of, they could pull out three, four people, or we can pull out three, four people to work on a proposal for two months. Local organizations, of course, don't have that same uh, resources to draw from. Um, so that was another interesting finding that this whole competition issue came out. And that has, of course, also led to the whole thinking about, or has led to us thinking more about us as city children, about competition versus complementarity. Because as far as I still understand, <laughs> our mandate is still complementary to whatever's going on. It's not basically going in there and doing it with others when others can do it. Um, and hence, actually, that's one of the reasons, among many, that we have tomorrow an event on complementarity and coordination. Um, so tomorrow afternoon, we're focusing in on that as, as part of this localization week, because there is something that doesn't fit together when we are competing while our mandate is complementary. So that was kind of the main um, findings from the uh, Horn of Africa report. And please read it, because there's a lot of good stuff there. There's a lot of recommendations. And everything I said before holds true for this report as well. Um, so most of the literature list is actually referencing other reports and looking at other reports. Um, and you will also find the recommendations for all the different usual bodies, uh, UN bodies, INGOs, and for local organizations. Good. Um, we're actually also doing another report um, on uh, the Sulawesi earthquake um, in Indonesia, looking at that response. Also together with Tufts University, uh, pretty much the same team as we had before. And since the report is not finished, I can't say much about it, other than the fact that we, again, work with a bias towards local organizations. So we did 50 interviews just in Sulawesi. So it was a much smaller area we were trying to cover this time geographically. Um, so uh, 50 interviews um, with a bias, 70% of those interviews were with local organizations, 30% with international access um, of different kinds. 
Um, we did it actually also together with the uh, uh, local university or uh, the Palo University in Sulawesi because we were becoming aware also from the first research that we did that we wanted to um, be a little bit less kind of um, global north uh, leading the whole thing and trying to get more of those local resources in there. Um, and as I said, we're still validating the, the, the findings, um, but roughly I think one of the three ones that I can talk a little bit about now that's probably not going to change much is that there was a particular law imposed on the Sudavisi response where government, the Indonesian government basically um, made it very difficult for international organizations to work on their own. And kind of there was this regulation that they needed to work through uh, Indonesian organizations um, and entities. And what was actually found when we asked about them, that was across the board, it was that most people were actually quite happy with that. Uh, there were some issues around how it was implemented and other stuff and and there are definitely like rooms room for improvement but in general the idea we, everybody actually found that that was not a bad way to go about a humanitarian response despite um some of the challenges and issues that were the, that came with that model um so overall the, the, they were quite happy with that um again we found on capacities we're asking some of the same questions that we, as we did for the first report uh, on capacities, uh, we would found we would find that they were again perceived differently. Something that was coming out a lot from the local organizations and local actors and beneficiaries actually, that was around emotional capacity. Something that we've never seen, we've never worked with, as far as I know, in any way in the international system. So interesting to find that there's different ways again of understanding how do you do a good response. So emotional capacity that was really coming out a lot and standing out a lot. Um, and then a third thing, and this also kind of links to what you were talking about, Lisa, and before, around um, how what is, what is it to be local? Um, that basically the way we do, we've been doing our research and also much of the other things that's going on um, is simplifying uh, the whole kind of notion of, of being local and the notion of localization. There's a lot more going on that we're not really seeing because we work kind of um, with, with, with certain categories, uh, one being, for instance, the nationalized NGOs, so international NGOs who register locally. Uh, Save Children is doing that in Indonesia and also in many other, many other places, other NGOs are doing the same thing. What does that mean and where does that fit into the categories? But also seeing national uh, Indonesian organizations who's partnering with smaller local Indonesian organizations. So basically almost having the same relation as INGOs traditionally have with national organizations or local organizations, but seeing that same pattern being um, repeated, I guess, between national organizations and local organizations. So that's the third finding that there's a lot more to the whole kind of the way we work with categories um, in the humanitarian system that we basically need to think a lot more about. And I'm going to pause <laughs> and hand over to David. Okay, I'm a bit conscious of time, so I'll try and keep this um, this brief. Uh, my name is David Miller. Um, I work for Save the Children Sweden, based in Stockholm, um, supporting programs in Syria and Iraq. I'm actually filling in for a colleague today, Jeanette Lumbe, who's our um, advisor on, on partnerships and localization. Um, so I hope I can do some justice. Um, but uh, what I'm trying to do is just give you a, a taster of two reports. Um, they're not finalized yet, but hopefully in the next couple of weeks they will be. Um, but just to give you a taster, uh, uh, so um, that when they're out, um, hopefully you'll be interested to look more into them. Um, and both reports are focused, focused on localization in conflict. Um, and when we talk about localization in, in these reports, we're really talking about um, the ability of um, crisis affected people to um, lead on decisions about how aid is used, um, either directly or through their representatives, CSOs and, and, and local institutions. So um, why, is, why is this important and, and what, what, new, um, what new information are we bringing in these reports? Um, well, I think the the, um, there is this um, uh, assumption um, in, um, in the Grand Bargains Committee here um, and in some of the literature that actually in conflict settings, um, 
localization is different than it is in disaster settings. Um, that somehow it doesn't apply, or there are just diff cir different circumstances that mean that it's not as applicable in those kinds, kinds of settings. So these, these two papers kind of explore those um, issues as well. Um, and uh, in so doing, sort of contribute better to our understanding of localization in conflict contexts. Um, so the two papers. Um, the first one really is um, uh, looking at generally um, at localization in conflict, um, focusing on a, a couple of case stories um, from Myanmar and Syria. Um, and the second one is a learning. Um, a learning paper based on a program that implemented in Syria and um, mm -hmm. supporting um, Syrian civil society organizations in the crisis there. Um, they are, uh, I have to say, they're informed by um, local organizations and the staff of localized, local, local organizations, but the, um, the findings and recommendations are very much directed, directed at uh, international um, non-governmental organizations uh, like Save the Children. Um, that's because primarily we hold a lot of the power in these relationships um, and so we need to look at ourselves a lot um, in, in terms of changing um, the way we do things. Um, the two reports complement each other. I'd say the first report is, is much more looking at how we need to transform our organizations. Um, so it's a, a more of a top-down approach. And the second report is more about um, you know, how we can influence now in, 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 in the current context, how we can influence our programming um, to um, be more local. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, just just focusing on the on the first report, it was um, supported by both CJ and the IKEA Foundation, and was a collaboration between um, Save the Children and Save the World. Um, the the method was interviews uh, with. Um, with practitioners, um, primarily in Uganda, Myanmar, and Syria. And just to say that uh, of the 95 uh, participants, roughly two thirds were from local um, civil society organizations. Uh, it was also, there was also, there was also a round table um, uh, discussion of practitioners and researchers in December, 2018 in London that fed into, into, the, into the paper. Um, and there are also case studies, um, three of which are based in Myanmar uh, and one in Syria. Um, so just to, to cover some of the main uh, findings, then I won't go into everything. There's, there's quite a few. You know, we talked about recommendations and findings at the end. Um, there are quite a few of those, um, but I won't be able to cover those um, in the time I have. So just to talk about some of the, some of the key ones, just to, just to spike your interest, really. Um, so. Um, the, I guess there are two obstacles to localization, two main obstacles that are cited um, to localization in conflict context. Um, the first is around arguments about capacity that we've heard um, before, and also about um, partiality. Um, so the research looked at this and found there are very different views about capacity uh, and partiality between um, the staff of CSOs and the staff of INGOs. With the staff of CSOs seeing their capacity actually as being much stronger, and also what is considered capacity is very different. As we heard, you know, capacity from internationals is seen as the capacity maybe to comply with our requirements and those of our donors and that kind of thing. Whereas from CSOs, it was much more about their connection with communities and that kind of thing. Um, so there are differences there. Um, and the, the report kind of demystifies these and kind of debunks these. Um, showing that actually um, capacities do exist in many occasions, um, and in terms of partiality, um, you know, INGOs are also faced with, with the same kind of dilemmas that local, that local organizations face and have to navigate them uh, in a similar way. So it's not, it's not something that's particular to local organizations, this issue of partiality. Um, and one of the recommendations, recommendations for NGOs is that we really need to look into ourselves uh, and reflect on um, you know, the ways in which we are sustaining this marginalization of civil society um, and how we can actually make um, some significant uh, transformation in that respect. Uh, another interesting finding that came out strongly was the, um, 
prevailing prejudices within um, within the relationships between international and national organizations. So in terms of sexism, racism, and uh, colonialism, and how uh, those continue to affect um, localization. And, and when these are brought up in discussions, it creates a, a sort of a defensive reaction from, from international. Um, so this is an important uh, finding and an interesting finding and something I think that, that we feel could be looked at further in research and funded research to look at actually CSOs um, or local organizations experience of, of, of this um, prejudice and, and, and discrimination that they face. Um, and a third finding was um, how um, conflict creates marginalized groups. So, um, you know, looking at groups such as women, young people, which are often seen as a, as a sort of threat um, rather than a, a, an asset yeah, in these situations, and refugees who are often disempowered um, when they are displaced. Um, so uh, again, how can we, um, rather than con contributing to this marginalization, um, contribute to actually finding positive solutions where we include these groups of marginalized people? Okay, um, I'll just then go on to quickly on to the um, the um, second um, the second paper, which is a learning paper about the program in Syria. And Syria, I think, is a very interesting example of the localization um, because uh, you know prior to the crisis there were very few civil society organisations in Syria, um, and they emerged really as a response to the Arab Spring and as a response to the crisis that followed it. Um, by groups of people in their communities organizing um, to respond to, um, you know, to, to, the, to the, the, the situations that their communities were exposed to, um, both within Syria and, and, the, and the diaspora and the surrounding country. So they really grew from nothing very rapidly and became the primary responders in the Syria crisis. So over 75% of the response is actually implemented by um, local uh, and diaspora organizations in Syria. Um, but the interesting thing, so, so when we look at those the sort of traditional arguments about oh, they don't have the capacity and they don't, they're, they're, you know, they're partial, um, we can see that that doesn't really um, apply here, even with these fairly new organizations. But despite this, you know, only 1% of the funding is, um, uh, is received directly by these organizations. So they don't have control um, over how that funding is prioritized and where it goes and how it's used. Um, so there's a big discrepancy there. Um, so why, why is this, this, um, this, this particular learning paper interesting? Well, I think it, it shows um, what sort of role um, looking forward uh, and currently INGOs can play um, in, in a situation where aid is more localized. What can we offer to local um, civil society organizations um, in that kind of um, situation? Um, so the program itself was um, supporting um, Syrian civil society organizations to increase their capacity to respond to the humanitarian needs in their communities, um, with a longer term aim, actually, of um, strengthening um, Syrian civil society um, for the future, for a future peace, where they can con contribute to an, an inclusive and lasting and sustainable peace. Um, so it had those, those types of two, 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 two aims, both um, helping the humanitarian crisis, but also looking more long term to strengthening and uh, creating a diverse um, civil society in the future it, during, you know, in the midst of the crisis. Um, and uh, it, it did this, uh, we worked with 31 civil society organizations over three years, um, and it focused on both organizational development and um, uh, technical capacity development, particularly in child protection using a range of approaches from training to coaching mentoring to specific grant facilities to learn by doing uh, such like um, and also working a lot with remote methods um, obviously much many of the frontline staff we couldn't reach and the headquarters of the organizations we worked with um, couldn't reach either um, that were based in syria so a lot of it had to be done um, using remote methods so key findings um, from this um, again, going back to, to, to the diversity issue, um, so um, CSOs in Syria, they talk about NGOization, so how they're co-opted by uh, 
um, the, the international aid effort through the requirements we place on them. They have to follow our priorities. Um, and they really um, are in danger of losing their links to their constituencies, um, which is important when we look at localization and definition we have a bit that, that you know, they should be representing the crisis affected people in, in making sure that they are leading on the decisions on, on how it is implemented. Um, so that, that link to their constituencies is, is, is at risk of being eroded. Um, uh, and also we tend to work with the usual suspects, organisations that look like ourselves and, and miss some of those marginalised groups that I talked about earlier. Um, so there are two ways in which, in which the programme actually works to, to sort of preserve diversity um, within, um, within Syrian civil society and nurture it and, and bring in some of these marginalised groups. The first was to work with a broad section of cross section of CSOs. So we didn't just look at the, the usual suspects, but we looked at some of the smaller NGOs and youth organizations. We tried to work with an informal organization um, that wasn't registered. And the second way was actually by, as we said, talking to, as Cathy had mentioned earlier, by, by making sure that um, the local organizations were in charge of their, or led on their um, development processes. Um, so deciding on what their development priorities were, be, were and, and how they could meet those priorities. Um, uh, and uh, a lot of those was, was, was not about what we traditionally see as you know, strengthening their capacity to implement our programs, but about actually them um, being able to um, decide the direction of their organization, what types of organization they wanted to be, what direction they wanted to travel, et cetera as well as you know, strengthening operations and commanding capacity and such like um, the other the other lesson that i think was was an interesting lesson um, and there are several others that i won't mention um, is about responsible partnerships so that study by by interaction um, that was mentioned earlier um, also looks at this question and the fact that um, when ingos are looking at cso partners they often look at the risk of um, cso partners or local partners rather than the risks to those partners. And so um, local organizations are often left in a position where they're dealing with um, really quite um, difficult risks. You know, they're working in high risk environments, um, but they don't necessarily have the resources um, to, 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 to manage those risks. Um, and so they are really um, left exposed when, when things happen. They don't have the resources, they don't have the margins to cope with those risks that we that we uh, usually have and you know you often see NGOs will, will walk away from from you know if there's a if there's a fraud case or, or whatever NGOs will when their relationships with those with those organizations which can have a, a a real big impact on them. Um, so one of the ways um, that um, you know that, that we looked at managing those types of risks or we can contribute to helping um, CSOs manage those risks is through such capacity building by strengthening their you know, on a wide break, broad break at frontage, you know, on, on their financial systems, on their HR policies, on their safeguarding policies when it comes to um, when it comes to things like child safeguarding, when it comes to things like safety and security, staff welfare. Um, so, so that also that sort of gives them some of the the um, the capacity to actually manage risks in, in, in a good way um, and and sort of helps us. Their last sort of duty of care, moral duty of care to those organisations. So those, those are just a couple of, of, of the findings we have. Um, so I, I hope you, you know, when they come out, <laughs> they will be published on the resource centre, the um, Save the Children Resource Centre that Catherine mentioned earlier. Um, so I hope uh, everyone dives into those and reads them and finds them interesting and helpful in, in your work. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Question for them. Uh, for uh, after we have heard from uh, from Jeremy uh, Weller from ICPA, who is joining us remotely, and I'll just give you. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with ICPA. Um, it's been around since uh, 1962 and is a global network uh, of. Uh, I think about 100 uh, at least uh, refugee and, and uh, migration focused uh, NGOs across more than 100 countries. 
um, and um, the sort of the goal of the place to act as a bridge uh, between communitarian actors. And looks like we have Jeremy with us. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Thank you very much. I, I, I don't know if you caught my brief introduction, but you have been introduced. <laughs> I did catch uh, very briefly, thank you. Yeah. Great, I'll basically just hand it over to you, Jeremy, if that's all right. Yeah, excellent, thank you. And I, I also am a little bit limited in, in time. I have about 20 minutes before another call. So uh, I'll be brief and then we have some time for discussion. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me properly or not. I'm holding up a copy of a uh, report which I'm talking about today. The good news is this is not an upcoming piece of research, in fact, this is not a piece of research at all. This is uh, an already published document, which you can read yourselves online. Um, and what we tried to do in this piece of work is actually to pull together a whole lot of the different thinking around localization that was uh, happening towards the middle to end of 2019 last year. And we launched this document uh, at the World Humanitarian Action Forum in Istanbul in October. The aim here really was to, to try to unpack the, the localization process and, and particularly the terminology that's being used around localization, particularly with a view towards the NGO community, which is ICFA's focal point. As mentioned in the introduction, we have over 120 members, um, many of which are, are national, local or international organizations, but also many of which are networks themselves. So ICFA's got, got a very diverse um, membership base and we found that the perspectives and the interpretations of those perspectives within this membership have been extremely diverse. Um, and this has led to some very rich uh, and at times challenging discussion between NGOs in different contexts. The first few years after the World Humanitarian Summit, this was taking place a lot in the international, uh, global, some, somewhat at the regional spaces. But we've seen a real shift in the last uh, 12 months or so to a lot of dialogue happening amongst uh, NGOs at the national and even the sub-national levels in various settings. And this dialogue also starting to get a bit more uh, recognition in, in the broader space. So we wanted to, to try to develop a, a paper that would provide a little bit of context to where discussions are at, try to be a bit balanced in the perspectives in, in recognizing the, the real diversity of what was taking place in the NGO space, uh, and also to prompt a lot of questions for further discussion at national level, uh, because we really believe that it is at the national level where the, the, uh, the rubber hits the road, as, as it's been called in one report, on localization. Um, this was prompted also partly because we saw the grand bargain being used more and more in different national contexts as a mechanism through which NGOs wanted to discuss the grand bargain, but inherently this uh, approach has uh, a couple of uh, major flaws, particularly that the grand bargain was or still is an agreement between many of the existing uh, power holders, as, it, as you would say, in the humanitarian space, primarily donors and UN agencies, with uh, NGOs and the Red Cross movement coming uh, late to the day to the table, but certainly being very active since then. Um, but and, and this, this has meant that uh, the engagement of, of national NGOs and particularly national governments in that space was, was much, much later to start and has been much less structured. And, and this is, we feel, uh, led to a very uh, fragmented way of approaching the grand bargain at a national level uh, where NGOs and others are, are, are picking bits and pieces of the, of the, uh, of the overall uh, grand bargain and particularly of the localization work stream. Um, focusing a lot on com commitments related to, to funding and to capacity, and perhaps not necessarily then focusing on some of the other broader, uh, more broader issues and contextual uh, aspects that we see are very necessary. And some of the earlier presentations have really touched on these. Um, so what we did was we, we tried to, to basically pull apart localization and, and look at what different discussions, what different papers, what different research has been put forward. <laughs> Um, with, a, with a breakdown, uh, not necessarily uh, with, with great academic rigor, but with certainly lots of uh, um, animated discussion, shall we say, uh, looking at, at the different types of, of, uh, of 
efforts that are being put into understanding and, and implementing processes related to localization at, at, at national and subnational levels. And we particularly focused on, on two areas that are very well addressed, we thought, uh, which is the, the operational effectiveness uh, area and, and the financial or efficiency area, but also two areas which were not so well addressed, which was uh, the, the political or identity uh, considerations and the, the uh, accountability uh, linkages of localization. And we wanted to make sure that we, we had all of these four considered so, so that uh, the, the discussion would, would be able to start from a point where we're asking a lot of hard questions that are linked to these areas. Um, I won't say that, that we provide a lot of answers to all those questions, but we certainly wanted to, to, to start with this basis. Um, we then particularly uh, looking at the idea that localization as a process um, can be about strengthening humanitarian action uh, and improving on the humanitarian system, not only about reorganizing who sits at the table. And we wanted to put some questions in this regard forward because we found that, um, that some of this talk was not was, was lacking a little bit at the, at the national level uh, between NGOs. We'd, we'd moved into the conversations around, around power sharing or, or, or access to, to coordination fora without necessarily being able to, uh, to have different NGOs, both national, international, local, answer the question of, of, of how this actually improves the process, processes that they're involved in. We think this is really important and actually uh, ICFA with uh, the support of LSE have just, just about finished a piece of research looking at uh, the engagement of national NGOs in HCTs in three regions globally and not looking just at the numbers, which we can find fairly easily from OCHA, but looking at the, uh, the qualitative aspects of what, what are these NGOs bringing to the table? What barriers do they see to participation? What motivations do they actually have to engaging in this space? Um, and, and so therefore, hopefully to prompt some, some further thinking around how strengthening this engagement actually will improve these mechanisms, um, not just by uh, adding more seats to the table, as it were. We also looked a lot at local actors' perspectives. And this, this came about because many times when we went into discussions um, at the regional level, when we, when we talked to people who were doing different bits of work, uh, we found that we were looking at discussions that said that the local ecosystem was from INGOs to national NGOs to local NGOs, and maybe someone would occasionally mention civil society uh, organizations. And then, as, as we know and has also been uh, mentioned before, there, there's far more stakeholders in, involved, and, and particularly we thought we need to reconsider looking at localization from a community uh, or a people at the center perspective uh, and, and building our understanding of of who are all the different stakeholders in, in, the, uh, in, in play at, at a national or, or subnational context. Uh, so we looked at the uh, engaging perspectives of affected communities and, and, and host communities uh, in displacement settings, very importantly, uh, particularly looking at local and national governments and, and what, what their role is. And there's some research uh, that's been done around the Sulawesi response already. Uh, I think um, Katya mentioned just before another piece that's coming up very much uh, linked to the role of government in, de in defining the space for, for localization to unfold. And we see similar, um, similarly uh, interesting uh, elements of government uh, de definition of localization playing out in, in Bangladesh um, in the Rohingya response. We're seeing it in other places come more and more often. Uh, and, and we're questioning, are NGOs actually able to engage in these discussions with, with uh, the host crises in a meaningful way are we actually um, are we actually creating forums where we can discuss uh, outside the the NGO space about what the uh, the, the legal frameworks what the access uh, restrictions uh, that governments are sometimes implying in the name of localization actually mean from an NGO perspective and we think there's a lot more work here to be done uh, also looking around the role of uh, the Red Cross, Red Crescent societies at national level. There's been a lot of talk between uh, NGOs and IFRC, INGOs, uh, INGO networks and, and uh, the IFRC globally, and then a lot of bits of research that have been developed by uh, some of the Red Cross national societies with their partners. But we see a real lack of understanding about the, the engagement or the role of other Red Cross national societies uh, as potential allies to NGOs in this space, um, and, and in particularly in upholding and promoting uh, principled approaches within localization. So we think that there's some really interesting work here. 
And we also looked at uh, the questions around faith-based organizations and, uh, and other stakeholders, regional organizations, particularly uh, ASEAN um, being more motivated um, and particularly uh, also, I think, as was mentioned, private sector being part of broader civil society, but not necessarily um, engaging in a collective way with, uh, with NGOs or with CSOs in that space. The, the other interesting point I wanted just to, to highlight, to touch on quickly, is we wanted to look at the question of funding local action and not just looking at this as a, as a um, efficiency argument through the grand bargain lens of, of doing better with less uh, to go further, but actually saying, looking back at the original commitments where the grand bargain came from, and, and the third of the three recommendations of the high-level panel that on humanitarian financing, which, uh, which gave birth to the grand bargain, was actually to increase the resource base. And we think there's a lot of more work that needs to be done in, in understanding and, and, uh, and engaging with civil society about what they're already doing and what they can do to, to increase the resources available for humanitarian action. Uh, not, and, and, and I reflect again on the earlier presentation that, that uh, I think will be, very, uh, will be a great contribution in this space to saying what type of, of, uh, of private giving, what type of philanthropy are we looking at at local level and how can we engage with some of this from a humanitarian perspective. And again, there's been some fascinating work done in, in Malaysia and Indonesia, at least in this region, as well as otherwise, that's, that's looking at the role of, of Islamic social financing. Can this play a role in a humanitarian space? Um, and, and if so, what are the principles that need to underpin this? Uh, also looking at other types of private giving uh, and, and recognizing that we, that we always uh, seem to, to uh, end up talking about localization as new ways of dividing the pie and not actually about uh, ways of, of growing the pie, as it were, uh, and, and, and encouraging more action, uh, more, more funding uh, activity uh, from, from a diverse range of stakeholders to, to be brought to the table. Uh, and I think we, and we, we talked about a few other elements. I won't go into to that area. I just wanted to touch on a couple of, of points as well that, that have now developed since then. Um, and I'm holding up another piece of, uh, of work that's just been published. This is called Humanitarian Aid Localization from one of ICFA's new members, which is Human Initiative in Indonesia. This is a very large NGO from Indonesia that's recently joined. But what's interesting is this is, this is one of the few pieces actually we've, we've seen where, where national, um, national organizations, and, and in this case, one that's now moving into the international space, are actually developing their own pieces of work on localization, not as part of a project of an INGO, but actually about their homegrown thinking on, on why they do what they do, why they do humanitarian action the way they do it, and how they intend to engage in the, in the humanitarian space. And we at ICFA think this is really fascinating because we, we, we're missing a lot of perspectives from NGOs um, on particularly what it means to be an NGO in, in their own context, but then um, linked to our work, what it means to be a humanitarian in that context. Uh, and this is really uh, quite interesting and we think very important work that needs to continue over the coming months and years to help to, uh, to amplify the voices of different local and national actors around their own narrative on humanitarianism. And then we find a way to bring that, uh, those perspectives to, to match what we consider the, the international global perspective on humanitarianism. Um, because we haven't really in engaged in very deep conversations here. Uh, and I think people are at some times uh, a bit challenged to discuss principles, humanitarian principles or otherwise. Uh, but I think we recognize that there's a great need to. Uh, for ICFA, there's a great need to because we're a network that's motivated on promoting principled and effective humanitarian action. We must, we must therefore understand what those principles mean. Uh, and so we're really interested in looking at further work in this space. Um, and also linked to that, looking at what, what does it mean to be humanitarian for local organizations, particularly in contexts where they're not always operating in a humanitarian modality, which uh, if we consider Asia and the Pacific region where I work is, is most of the time. We have NGOs that are primarily development or even rights-based organizations that become humanitarians when a humanitarian response is required. And how, how do they move into that modality? How do they move out of that modality? And, and what does it actually mean in terms of their operation? Do they, do they, as someone in the Philippines once said to me, you know, put on their, take off their Superman suit and put on their Batman suit? 
is that is that how they, we know that they're now humanitarians, um, or or is there a much more nuanced way of understanding that that there are times when a Prince of Water approach uh, is is applicable, there are times when these NGOs are doing other work, and therefore there needs to be a space for civil society to be uh, and civil society space needs to be flexible enough in which it will allow these organizations to, to change modalities as needed. Uh, and my final point would be the topic of risk, which has been mentioned, and, and uh, ICFA's just released a paper on this topic. Our annual conference coming up in two weeks, <coughs> excuse me, will be exactly, exactly related to principles and risk. Uh, and we see this as very, uh, very important and, and absolutely central to the discussion at the moment, uh, particularly moving forward, um, some of the grand bargain commitments related to, to funding um, and to donor engagement because the issue of risk transference or, or avoidance of risk uh, is becoming a really, a really critical topic that if not addressed soon, we think is going to leave the um, many, many NGOs, not, not just local, national, but also international uh, in, in some very challenging situations in, in relation to their, their work on localization uh, and their work more generally. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, I hope I was clear throughout uh, and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Jeremy. You heard me loud and clear. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any questions for Jeremy? Uh, we have a uh, Thanks, Jeremy. This is Kamal from the Global Education Cluster. Oh. Um, so, can you hear me? Yeah. So my question is, you at some point you mentioned about local funding, the like, like local pool funding, I think. Uh, are there any good examples of that that can be uh, replicated? And yeah, thank you. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, it's a very good question, actually. Uh, local approaches to fundraising uh, are, are really, um, are really, I think, in their infancy, at least, of being understood at a, at a structural level. Uh, I, I always talk about an example uh, from the Philippines called SAFER, Shared Aid Fund for Emergency Response, which is a NGO-led uh, and managed pool fund that has been set up within the Philippines by a number of uh, NGO networks and consortia. Uh, and I think this, this grew out of some original work done by the Start Network in some of their shifting the power work in or their DEP work in, in the region. Uh, and it, it's fascinating. Uh, it's a fascinating example of, of a local action uh, approach where CSOs raise funds collectively um, in a model and then, and then uh, also dis disperse those funds collectively based on who's best placed within the country. To um, so it's not, it's not a necessarily a competitive pooled fund um, as, as some of the, the, the international models are because uh, they don't necessarily, uh, are, they're not necessarily making application based on who's got the best, uh, the best response plan per sector. They're making, uh, application based on a lot of other locally relevant factors as well. And we think this is very interesting, but admittedly it's been quite challenging um, for a number of years now to set this up and, and the scale is still fel relatively small. So we're hoping that, that this type of model will, be in, uh, will receive more investment in future. Um, and the other mechanism I mentioned before around, uh, around um, Islamic social financing, and there's been quite a lot of work done uh, within within some of the larger NGOs, particularly in, in Indonesia, around looking at where, when can they use that money and when can they not. And pooled funds are also talked about as a potential opportunity for uh, for um, I don't want to say washing the money, but uh, but uh, uh, enabling it to be a little bit more um, distance in in a way that that some other donors contribute to pooled funds as well. Um, and uh, and maybe making it able to be uh, used for some human humanitarian um, uh, delivery or outcomes. But there's a lot of questions that, that I think need to be, uh, need to be answered uh, by the experts within this field about, about where the lines are drawn, um, because these are not very clear at the moment. Thank you very much. I have one more question, and then I should probably move on to the question. Okay. I'll ask. Hi, Jeremy, and thanks for calling in. <laughs> We've been talking a few times already. Um, just a question on going back kind of to the research part of it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so my question to you is, we talked about all these different reports that we've all launched. Save Children has done some, it has done lots. Um, there's so many reports out there, with all these recommendations. How do you see those recommendations um, being picked up um, by international organizations and the whole kind of, yeah, and the international system? 
Look, it's, I think it's very interesting because there's a couple of answers to this. One, one answer would be uh, that the recommendations are picked up sporadically because it seems like uh, each organization you talk to, if you, if you start to talk particularly within the larger federations or within some of the larger uh, INGOs, they have they have bits and pieces that are that are easier for them due to their business model, their structure, their their approach, their their history, and these areas are progressing faster than others. So um, I think it's it's not it's not easy to give a, an answer to say that there's a cohesive uh, uptake of of um, many of the recommendations that have been made. And and if anything, I'd say it's a perhaps opportunistic uptake because. Um, Organizations have made broad commitments at a global level and not necessarily outline how they're going to get to those to, to achieving those commitments. So um, pe people in various decision making positions are, are able to, to be a bit flexible. And we certainly see this looking at, at the national level for INGOs, the, the perspectives of, of country directors that I talk to um, often as my regular point of contact or regional directors will not necessarily be the same as the position of policy people in Geneva or globally. And this, um, this uh, disparity is, is actually, uh, it's one of the challenges I think we need to continue to address. What's interesting now is I think um, in my observation uh, and speaking to colleagues as well, we see that although national and local NGOs do not produce particularly large amount of, of writing on this subject with, with a few exceptions, uh, primarily because they don't have resources to dedicate to this. Um, um, but I would say the readership of a lot of these reports is uh, skewed with, with no, uh, no evidence base behind this, in my opinion, is skewed towards national and local actors. We are seeing people who are very well informed, reading a lot of the publications, coming to us and asking for more and asking us to, to uh, help them understand what's being written so they can, they can um, then sensitize it to their own context. Uh, so, I think the audience is definitely there, but it's, it may not necessarily be the INGOs that are the number one audience and, and certainly not um, the uh, UN agencies. <laughs> I think are very much, um, are very much reading a lot of the work that's being put out there, um, but they're not changing very much as a result. So I think that there's a, you know, there, there is different levels of uptake um, and it's been quite interesting to observe. Over. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Uh, for joining us. Um, I think we'll move on uh, so that we do have some time at the end. So last, you know, if you don't mind, um, and maybe you will say a little bit about what, what APEX is as well. Um, but I think we need to, to talk to us a bit about sort of how do we make research knowledge accessible. I changed the title slightly. Yeah. <laughs> So, in preparing for this, I thought it was more accurate to actually talk about localizing the humanitarian narrative. And we've spoken a lot about biases today. I think everybody who came up here started by stating their biases, so I'll do the same. I'm not an academic, and I don't pretend to be. And what I tell you today is not so much a study that we've done. What I try to show you is how our practice is in ACAPS. Um, ACAPS is a small organization, about 40 people. Uh, most of us sit in Geneva. And we basically try to make sense out of crisis. Our slogan is see the crisis, change the outcome. So on one side, we try to produce evidence in real time that's good enough to actually inform decision making and not just be a finding after the operation that this was really not good. On the other hand, we keep a very close eye on decision making and try to think about are people actually reading what we do? Does this actually make a difference? Have we changed the outcome? I think my perspective today is informed by uh, the tension between the two parts of my career. For the first 15, 20 years, I, I worked very much in uh, first line response. I, I worked with a number of NGOs, with very much with the Red Cross movement, with ICSC Federation. A lot of the 40 hour, 48 hour response cycle, the really rough stuff where you go out to sudden onsets. I also spent time in Afghanistan, in Zimbabwe, and, and, and some of the more protracted crises. And 10 years ago, I came to ACAPS which was just, I started there up 10 years ago and, and didn't really know what it was about. But those 10 years have been a real journey of questioning my, my first, the first part of my career, of actually thinking about, did you know enough about the context? Did you actually have some evidence? Did you understand what you were doing and what guided your decision making? And so I come to you from a very humble position here on one side, 
I don't think I was very good at what I, I don't think I was worse than most other people, but I think we have a real problem in terms of not being honest about how little a role evidence actually plays in decision making and shaping humanitarian action. And so we don't have a lot of evidence about how we use evidence. There's been a couple of studies about it. One from uh, ODI, I think 10 years ago, called uh, According to Need, question mark, by James Darcy and Charles uh, and John Hoffman. And there's one quote there that I think still is true, and it talks about the mutual tendency of donors and agencies to construct and solve crises without evidence ever really answering the equation. Right? And so I'm very much with, with uh, Lisa on, we need to think about this as a business model. We need to talk about incentives and the power that's at play. Because localization is about power. It's about exclusion and inclusion. It's about shaping the narrative. I happen to think that the humanitarian paradigm of the future will be network-centric, that it'll be quite different from what we see today. And in that, the narrative, how we shape the narrative, how we tell the story about crisis, is going to be maybe the most strategic issue. If we want to mobilize all the people that, that you spoke about from Tanzania, for example, the narrative, the way we tell that story, the way we decide what to do, not how we do it, but how do we decide what to do, that's really the key issue. And if we don't have evidence in there, then what are we actually doing? So that's, that's a bit about where I come from and, and what my perspective is. <clears throat> um, I'd like to start by just telling two stories. I've, I've been working at ACAPS for 10 years, and if you're in the same position for 10 years, your office tends to sort of plug up. So I cleaned it out last week. I think I threw away a pile about a meter high of reports. And I wonder how many of those reports did I read? How many of those reports did actually change anything? So go home and check your offices after this and ask yourself the same question. When we put it down on paper, what does it change? Does it change the outcome? Do you see the crisis? The second one was from, it was actually a conference held by the Center for Humanitarian Leadership at the Deakin University in Melbourne, where we discussed localization. And there was a guy called Frank, Frank is Ghanian, who works with World Vision, and he's a fantastic guy in his mid thirties. He's really like a model of what a humanitarian should be, he's committed, he's smart, he's funny. And he did a brilliant presentation. And we had, uh, at the same time, a discussion around NIA, the NIA network, and that whole thing. And, and at some stage, somebody asked the, the head of, of, of the NIA network, so according to you, is Frank local? And she said, no, because he works for World Vision. So he was delocalized, we called it afterwards. It's a great joke. At the, at the conference, and, and it really made me think about the, the, the tension between the personal and the institutional, and it's back to the power again. And I think when we have such a difficulty in cracking this and moving forward on it, it's one, because we don't really confront this. How many chief financial officers from your, from your organizations are present in the room today? How many fundraisers are here? That's interesting, right? Because inside your, and, and, and uh, the previous speaker spoke to this, there's a tension inside the organizations we work in, right? You want the good stuff. You want localization. Other people's job is to make sure you get a paycheck every month. And so scale, money, collecting money, shaping the narrative because we need to get people to give us money is also part of it. How does that intersect with your excellent report? I'm not questioning the policy of the report. Sure. I, th I thought they were really, it was nice to see the, the whole localization debate broken down in a much more nuanced way than I think it often plays out. But what does it mean to the decision making internally in your organization? Ask yourself. Right? So that, that was sort of the framing from my side. And so let's look at localizing. And again, this is ACAPS's practice. This is how we see it. And this is how we try to influence decision making in the sector. And so, one, it should we really talk about a humanitarian architecture or is it a ecosystem? We like to think it's an ecosystem. Why do we talk about an ecosystem? For three reasons. It's diverse, it's evolving, and it's connected, which are exactly the qualities that we need to look for in the future of humanitarian aid. And I think sometimes we overlook that we think we're so different because, because we, com we compete with each other and, and coordination. And, but actually, the problem is we're too much alike. Right? We're incentivized too much in the same way. And so an ecosystem speaks to diversity and institutional diversity. And what does the ecosystem look like? 
On one side, we have affected populations, and these drawings are done by Sandy, who uh, does people who are pineapple people, people with cooking pots on their heads, and people with pot plants on their heads, just to illustrate the differences between affected populations. And then we have the experts who do an assessment. They come out, they look at people, and they write reports. <laughs> then you have people sitting around the table making some decisions. And as you can see, they have different powers. Hmm? Now, that's not the whole story. And this is, this is one of the problems I think I have with, with the human science sector. Is we, we tend to think that this is it. Right? It's the affected population is there. We go out and assess them, and then we make some decisions. Now, the problem with that is that we have access to a far wider range of information than ju what's just coming out of the field. Uh, information technology, remote sensing, uh, Twitter. They, they, there's a whole range of issues. And what we find is that there's simply not enough analytical capacity in the sector. There's so many people who are involved in response that we simply don't have enough brains. And so what we try to be are the guys who hoover that information and put it into a big funnel from where we can provide some more evidence-based priorities. I'll give you an example concretely from Syria. 2012, uh, we did a field assessment uh, cross-border into uh, northern Syria from Turkey, uh, the JRANS assessment. And on, until then, I would characterize the concern narrative in Syria as being very Damascus-centric. As we talked about reaching populations in opposition to the territory as going cross-line. Into, into those territories. And that report helped shed light on how bad the situation actually was in opposition held territory, not through the filter of what was going on in Damascus, but cross border from Turkey. And it helped open up the operation and give us an alternative strategy so that we could work cross line as well as cross border into those territories. And I think it's one of the best examples I've seen of where the humanitarian narrative actually shaped operation in a very, very direct manner. So this is how we, uh, we, we, we think about the ecosystem, that, that the analysis part, which is where we belong in ACAPS, this is what we do, we analyze. Doesn't, that needs to be there because the coordination system itself is too focused on, we're too much in the operational crunch to actually, uh, to actually ingest evidence. And I think in your Tanzania study, please include sudden onset, please include locus, because that's where the tensions come out. We don't want to study ourselves when we're at our best, but when we're at our worst, worst. That's where we make the mistakes. Right? So that, that's our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we talk about telling story. We have basically gone on a journey where we started about talking about confidence intervals and sampling methodologies, and, and I don't know what. And today we talk about storytelling and shaping narratives. Gives you an idea. So for us, when we talk about localization, we, we prefer localization because we actually think that a diversity of perspectives strengthens the humanitarian narrative. We, our, our mantra sort of is you need connected, contrasting, and complementary perspectives to get a robust humanitarian narrative. So I think sometimes we talk about localization a bit as a zero-sum game. What is it as, as local as possible, as, as global as necessary? Is that how it goes? I think that's, that's in a sense, I, I like that, but it's also very linear. And it is a bit zero sum, but I think it's formulated like that because power is in the room. And ultimately, that's about how many percent goes to local organizations rather to the, the INGOs. And so basically what we try to do is, on one side, ensure that the evidence that goes into the machine is stronger by doing better designed assessment that give more space to local voices, that local knowledge is integrated more in response. I remember speaking to a representative from Venezuelan civil society who told me I went to Archer in New York and I spoke to him and he was like knocking on a wall. There was no space for his version of what was happening to his country. Right? And, and, and there was a very heavy political game around Venezuela back then and there simply was no space from the UN system to ingest a very valid local perspective which could have added to our understanding of what was going on. Local languages, obviously, is, is important that, that if you only write and analyze in English, you don't get the point. Uh, so, so this whole side is about designing assessments better and ensuring that we have a better quality, more uh, wider 
source of data to, to work from. Then around uh, developing the narrative, who actually sits at the meetings where we discuss? If you go to, to, to uh, the HNOs and the HRPs of the, of the humanitarian country team, who sits around that table? Who decides what the problem statement actually is? And our point here with the drawing is, of course, that crisis affected populations must have a direct influence and voice in that process. You cannot exclude them from that. You cannot turn it into a technocratic question of, um, of expert judgment. You need to balance, as it says, on the funnel, local priorities with expert judgment. There needs to be that dialogue. And we know very well who wins that battle normally. Then on the other hand, there's the capacity issue. And, and our approach, and again, I don't pretend that, uh, that this is the solution to everything, but that's the space we've found to add value, is that first and foremost, it, it's about not coming out and teaching and, 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 and capacity building. It's about working with people. Right? You don't need to teach them how to understand their context. They know it. So it's about sitting together, working together, and finding a respectful way of balancing the input into the global humanitarian narrative. then why don't we use evidence? Why, why, why? Because it's not because we don't want it, right? I think, I think there's a general will to do the right thing, but there are some difficulties in it. And I think there's a lot of information. It's not like we lack information. There's a tsunami of information, right? If you look at the number of reports on Relief Web, it's more or less quadrupled over the past couple of years. There's a massive amount of information, but it's scattered, it's a very varying quality, and actually finding the signal in the noise is very difficult. Right? So, so it is really difficult. Uh, a lot of inc inconsistencies and information gaps, and that's not a bug, that's not, that's not something we can change. That's a fact of life for humanitarians, that we will always work with a very uneven information space, and it's dynamic, it changes a lot. So we can't actually, we don't have the luxury of sitting down with a very clear picture. We do work in murky situations that change all the time, and we have to make decisions very quickly. So inconsistencies and information gaps is a barrier. Data sharing is a massive issue. I find it fascinating that the, the, the information collected by the UN, by a lot of the INGOs, is by and large funded with public money. Now, is that data available? No, no, no. It becomes the proprietary owner, you know, the owner. They own that data, they don't share it. And that needs to change. So for me, it's great that we unpack localization. It's great that we do this work. We also have to start, start talking about how do we share data? How do we, how do we make it a collective responsibility to analyze this? How do we lower the barriers that are there and that are, that are, that are discriminating and excluding voices that we really need to hear? Uh, it takes time. We have plenty of information managers. How many analysts work in your organization? How many dedicated ring fence analysts do you have? In 2010, I was the, the team, the UNDAC, the United Nations Disaster Service and Coordination Team Leader in the Pakistan floods. And we, we were sent down there with the brief saying, oh, you don't do the world's best assessment because there's a well-functioning OCHA office there. So we don't, you know, just focus on the assessment. But in 24 hours, I was the only one left in Islamabad the rest were out coordinating and responding. And so if you don't have ring fence analysts, people who can only do that and cannot be siphoned off, they will be involved in the response back to the locus that should be included in your study, I think, because that's what will happen there. Right. Then if we look at, at this is what we call the, the analysis spectrum. But what we're quite good at exploring, and we love to collect data, right? And we also do describe what we found. Do we explain it? Sometimes. Do we really interpret it? Hardly ever, because if you start interpreting, then you can get in real trouble, because then you have opinions. And somebody might challenge that. So that we're not so happy with. And again, information management, it's nice and tidy to make data sets interoperable and make sure the metadata is fine and so on. But to actually say, this is what it means, and no, I don't think this is a food crisis in the sense that you're describing it. I don't think, I think, I, I think it's there. It's not about availability, it's about access. So no, don't ship and dump. You should do cash, for example. Right? That, 
then you turn into very political, very contested territory. We don't anticipate enough, you know, scenario development, uh, projecting different futures, horizon scanning for risks. We, we don't do that nearly enough. And there's a massive disconnect between then the, the, the response analysis, the response options chosen, and the evidence. base. So that's the analysis spectrum. Uh, then past dependency is what we try to, to look at here. 95% of the things that happen have happened before. A few exceptions. But if, if there's a storm in Indonesia or in the Philippines, they've seen it. Mozambique. It's repetitive. And so we what we tend to do is go where we went last time, maybe tweak it 10%. But actually, if you have a whole bunch of evidence showing you that the, the past fees traveled, if you want, that that's where we should go, we rarely do that. And donors, of course, have priorities. And of course, shape the way we think about things. And I think that has been said a couple of times here with the role that that INGOs play with their local partners. They shape because they know what, what they can get money for, so that they, they change their the way of talking about things. And that power and the way we shape in a very invisible way the humanitarian narrative because of money, I think, is also a big factor. Uh, then there is to a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So, and there's a good and a bad side to this. On one side, if you work for uh, an agency focused on children, your job is to advocate on behalf of children. So of course you're gonna have tunnel vision on that. That's your job. But the question is then, how do you balance that off Help Age International who help the elder? Who actually negotiates that, right? So it's not just, I'm not just saying, oh, you know, Everybody's just looking out for their own little slice. That's their job. I see that, and I see the diversity as a strength. But it can become a vulnerability if we don't find a way of negotiating. And then there is the issue of the loudest voice in the room. Right? And the two main findings of the studies we've done of, of decision making is that it's past dependency, so we do more or less what we did last time. And the loudest voice in the room shapes the agenda. So if you look at the political economy of the humanitarian country team that'll tell you a lot about how the crisis is going to be shaped. Yeah. So that, that, those are some of the obstacles. Then, and this is my last drawing, um, what, we, what we then try to do is, is say, so we all have biases and we're all pulled in different directions. And the, the point here is, again, that the pot plant people mainly look at help for pot plants. The pineapple people have pineapple leaves. Now, I, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that local organizations are incapable of being principled and that they're always biased towards. I'm, I'm saying we're all shaped by where we stand. And we have to put that on the table because you cannot objectively identify this. You have to see it as a sense-making process where we tell a story, we shape a narrative. And part of that is that where you stand depends on where you sit. There's no doubt about it. Right? it will be, if, if not, then why did every single speaker today start by stating their own biases? Right? We all have biases. Of course, local organizations do as well. That's not a problem. That, that's just the way it is. And finding a way of integrating that in our way of talking about this, I think, is key. And I find it incredibly annoying that it's often used as a tool to exclude people. Say, oh, you know, they're not principled. I'm sorry. From the least principal actions I've seen comes from some of the biggest organizations in this in this sector. And I don't think it's a, it makes any point to make to mention concrete organizations because I think it's systemic. Right? Uh, I'm not an academic, so I don't have to be so careful. Um, and so we think we have to recognize those differences, and in, in particular in conflict settings, we have to integrate. Uh, the conflict analysis, political economy analysis in it and have a um, have a diversity of opinions around the table. And that's where the grand bargain sometimes does worry me because if you read the text of Priority 5, which is around needs assessment, it talks about having one consolidated view coming out of the humanitarian country team. And there are two problems with that. One, that it really incentivizes squashing dissent. So if somebody disagrees, 
will silence it because we need one consolidated view. And secondly, it'll make us overstate the case, polish the data to make it look better, to use it as an advocacy tool. We've just, we've just, excuse me, we've just done a, a global index on comparing severity of crisis. And we we compared that to what organizations do. And basically there are two systemic biases coming out. One, the independent index picks up many more crises. Organizations have a tendency to only look at what they tend to do something about. And secondly, organizations tend to overstate the severity of the crisis they do pick up significantly in order to assist fundraising. Right? And so we have to be really, really careful that in, in chasing coordination and efficiency, we don't kill the assessment ecosystem. That we don't create a situation where it will be path dependency and the loudest voice that determines what happens because we can only have one opinion. And we have to stop the knee jerk reaction of saying redundant and little capacity in uncertainty is wasteful. It's not, it's a very smart strategy. And there's a tension between our wish to coordinate and that I found very much. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. right, so you only want one treatment, but you may want a second opinion. Is what I'm saying. All right. Thank you. Anybody online? I see two here. Um, I was just wondering when you said um, you said that you come up with the outsourcing programs. Did you reflect on what that means and what would be the response to that? Because I'm just thinking of all sorts of kinds of responses to, to address that and some of them a bit unhelpful. <laughs> so I, I think it's inevitable. Yeah. I, I think that's how it is. And I think, first of all, we need to stop thinking about ourselves as the good guy. I, or rather thinking about the institutions we work for as the good guys. I don't, I don't think they're the good guys. I think they're institutions. And I think institutions are incentivized in certain ways. And so the solution we try to, in, in our little way, the way we try to tweak it is to um, provide an independent input into uh, the sense-making process. And when I say independent, I mean two things, obviously not unbiased, I think, not like that. but it is operationally independent. So we don't really care whether it's food or wash or children or the elderly who gets the priority, our incentive is to understand it as accurately as possible. And secondly, we don't have an operational footprint to the same extent as many of the organizations you work for. So we can say things that is more difficult for somebody who has an operation. To say we want to get a scenario on Lebanon collapsing as a result of influx from Syria. Now, if you're a UN agency in Lebanon, you don't, you don't want to say that. It's not a smart thing to do, but it's a smart thing to have it out there so we can think about it. And I think we need to get much, we, we need to have a much more sophisticated understanding of humanitarian architecture than what you see today with the IAC echo chamber. I'm just thinking also that there's a point actually when you do talk to um, communities and local organizations that, um, you know, one is to even access the room where decisions are being made, which you do, if you are eloquent, you will go much further. And that's an interesting part because if not, it doesn't matter if you sit there or not. No, and, and I think I think it is fascinating to see how power plays out in those fora and how, how we exclude extremely capable and not small CSO organizations, I mean large national NGOs who don't feel comfortable, who don't feel at home. Too. And so you have this, this this parallel system of an international bubble next to a domestic response. And that for me is also about power. I also think that we have to recognize that if your job, if you're sent to Hurricane Idai in, in, in Mozambique or save the children or whoever, your job is to position save the children. That, that's your job. And you know as well as me what gets you credit and what doesn't. I do, you know, the, the big ones are famous for focusing on scale, which they have very good reasons for, but can sit very uncomfortably with investing time in building good, solid partnerships that don't scale, but may deliver really good value. 
And I think the language we use is really important. So that's why we do this, to try to, to come up with a different way of thinking about it. Because it does become very technocratic. That's it. It's difficult to agree with anything you say because it's different what we experience, especially on the power dynamic side of things. Um, so in this room, we actually have same children from localization tasking. We're basically the people kind of tasked with pushing that agenda ahead uh, and save the children. We're going to spend the next three days discussing, well, how do we do that on top of what we're kind of already doing? What is it we have to do better and more and differently? Um, we're developing policies and stuff, but we can, you know, we're doing lots of different things. In your view, what should we be discussing over the next three days? What is it that, what is it that's going to cause that change? Um, how can we make that internal change in the huge organizations that's also fragmented, as we also discussed? Well, I think several things, right? I think on one side, we need to tell a better story about how we make sense of the crisis, how we actually take it. I don't think we're very honest. With that. And I think the way we, we portray it, underestimates the uncertainty, polishes things, make them look better than they actually are. And I think we need to change it to the, we need to go from one consolidated view from the ACT to, to contrasting complementary and connected perspectives, creating a robust team uh, So it's, it's a shift in the way we think about change. It's one thing. And then secondly, I think recognizing the, the, the power dynamic inside your own organization. And then it's about striking. I, I think we're all on one side committed to humanitarian, who want to see a real change. On the other side, we also have a, a day job. And, and there's a tension between those two. I don't think I've ever gotten in, in as much trouble in my career <laughs> as when I said no to money. It's the least popular decision I've ever made. You know? and, and I'm finding ways to, in, in a case, talk about the dance and disrupt with the system. Right? Stolen from. Dark and green, right? But we have to find ways of mobilizing a network of very committed individuals that exist across the sector, who does believe in it, and then find ways of effectuating real change. And I'm not sure that I think we understand the problem. Mm -hmm. I think the, the, the dynamics are well understood. And if you've been about, around the block a few times and you come to a new disaster, I think. You know a lot of how this part plays out. I think the problems we have been unable to really address and solve uh, with the grand bargain, for example, are the ones that don't recognize sufficiently the power dynamics in the sector. We have 50% of the overall humanitarian expenditure going to three agencies, like WPHCR and UNICEF. I was at a meeting recently where it was in, we're trying to develop the policy framework for the assessment. And, and one of the the comments from, from one of the agencies was that ACAP and somebody called REITs that you may know should not be in the room because we have too many vested interests. And yeah, I, I almost lost it because it's like, it's not like we don't have an interest, but I mean, look at yourself. I was the only person in that room who did not work for the UN, none of your organizations. Right? And so well, there, there's, a, there's a dynamic of, of consolidation and concentration of power that I think is going to be accelerated by cash distribution that I find worrying on one side because it's going to concentrate power in very few hands and I think that it's not a good idea. I think diversity is a strength. On the other hand, I do think it will force the INGOs to diversify and change. I think that's right. I, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to, you know, we were saying sort of the, 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 the weaknesses and the problems are systemic, so there's no point in highlighting any one particular organization because it's so systemic. But if I was to say, where do you see some promising practices in terms of being more evident? And I know that there's a whole spectrum of, of events and of actions, but if you were to highlight something because it's useful to highlight in this context, what would that be? Um, I, think, uh, I think on one side, for example, uh, if I can pick one Mercy Corps uh, humanitarian access team uh, doing brilliant work, and have really, uh, I think, managed to, uh, and this is just the ones I'm familiar with, have really managed to, to bring evidence to the table in a number of contexts. I think, um, I, I, I think NRC's work with, with, uh, with human access, for example, is also interesting. I'm sure there are many good examples. 
And I was hesitant to bring up anyone in particular because I don't think that's the point. The point is gravity sets in. Right, so it may come up, but but the incentives are so strong that that after a year or two, somebody moves on. I'm trying to stretch mindsets here. I don't think it's that bleak. And I, I don't question the commitment of all of the colleagues and, and friends I have in this sector. But I do think we have to take an honest look at the power dynamics of the organizations we work in. First of all, I appreciate your your perspective with the systemic uh, perspective on it, and and the fact that what I hear you saying is that organization is more than just looking at it geographically; it's also institutional um, power dynamics. I just appreciate that. My question is um, is around what you ended uh, your last point around. Um, um, I don't remember this, but I'm. In my head, I'm thinking um, the roles of the, the donors also had a point around, around that. And, and um, I certainly I certainly experience in, in my everyday that that what you talk about around consolidation and we have, I think we see a trend around with the donors, they are, they are putting out a lot of fewer grants, but maybe quite big yeah. grants. And, and um, so my question is really, um, I don't know if it's provocative or not, but but is is like the bottom of localization? How realistic is that? Without, um, I mean, is bottom down localization? Is that actually what is the only way forward, or uh, or can it happen the other way around? It's uh, maybe it's a bit like um, uh, black and white, uh, but just uh, that perspective because. In my everyday life, I'm very much in the compliance donor world, and uh, and that's just uh, that's just a premise of, of what we do. Um, so maybe if you have, yeah, I, the, somebody mentioned the start network earlier, right? And 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 Sean Laurie, who used to lead that, talks a lot about um, growing a new humanitarian economy, and I think that is part of the point. I think it's very difficult to break. The, what's happening with with the current money, but I also think we we can we can do better in being creative. I'll I'll give you an example. I've been working with some people from the the travel industry uh, on figuring out how you can repurpose uh, tourism infrastructure for sudden onset uh, response. Right? If you think about it, tour, tourism is about people on the move. They have everything you need to actually cater for people on the move, and at the same time, they're located in some of the most vulnerable. Uh, you know, Mozambique, uh, the Caribbean, they, they, they are located in areas that will be hit more and more because of climate change. <clears throat> and so it totally makes sense to get somehow them involved and the scale is staggering. If you, if you take the global humanitarian expenditure, it's the size of the chewing gum industry. Right? That, that we spend as much money chewing gum as we do helping people. If you take one travel agent, TUI, T-U-I, you know all those guys? Their expenditure is 80% of the total humanitarian expenditure, that one company alone. Right? So the scale is amazing. Now, we spoke about how could we somehow siphon some of that money off to make sure that we repurpose it, that sort of thing. right? And I could feel being so reluctant to go and involve any of the mainstream humanitarian organizations because I knew who they would send. They would send their fundraise. They would send their finance directors. Great. Booking.com, come give us your money. And they, you know, and they would suck it into making whoever bigger, right? And what we should be doing is instead finding out how can we leverage this? How, how can we mobilize, if you want, a humanitarian starfish? That's a bit what I heard you talk about also. Right? How, how can we mobilize non-humanitarian force multipliers to do the heavy lifting for us? And I'm very skeptical. I, I think there's a lot of goodwill in donor agencies as well. I think a lot of the colleagues, we have a tendency to, to see ourselves as you know, the sensible people, but the donors are the donors. I don't, that's not what I find. I find a tremendous amount of sensible people on that side as well. And I think there's a lot of goodwill and an attempt to try to change things. It's also very difficult because we are, as you say, under very heavy compliance regulations, right? Anti-terror is uh, Yes. If, I, I, if, I, if you hear me saying it's easy, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is we have to be creative and I think institutional diversity 
and specialization will foster collaboration rather than a competitive coordination of that. I was just going to say, where does it pass the end of the end? So, so if you also have obviously more questions for us or any of the other panelists, uh, otherwise, over the chair, but keep that in mind. Anti-academic. I don't hear. I hope you hear me. Not at all. I think it's very valuable and can can add value and deepen our understanding of what we do. But I sometimes feel that the, it's 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 the problems we are unable to crack so far. I sometimes feel like we're seeking complicated solutions to complex problems. In other words, don't write a report. Do a meme. Make something go viral. Instead of ten most livable cities, do ten least livable refugee camps. So I know. I mean, you know, we can shape the narrative in many different ways. Think about how your daily consumption of news and information is. Are we playing that field? Are we playing that field to shape the humanitarian narrative to mobilize people to give room for voices? I don't think. I I, I think academic studies has an incredibly important role to play. I also don't think that's the bottleneck. Yes, right. Um, we have a question from Akam Al Mahini on the uh, on the uh, blessing to ask um, in relation to the uh, Abu Ghraib and the Mercy Corps um, team. Um, one of the things that characterized that, characterized that team was that we have a global staff and team yeah. who are informed about conflicts. Um, and such. And so we ask um, how hiring local staff into uh, these positions can help. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I think so. The unique thing about Mercy Corps is not that they have very capable local staff. I think every single organization has that. The unique unique thing is that they allocate resources to actually let these people voice their understanding and spend time analyzing it and making that available for the decision makers. So that's the unique feature. We have the capacities. They're there. Yeah. Um, I just want to follow up on some interesting things that have been said uh, throughout the morning and to put a couple of the things that you said together, which I think are quite provocative and interesting to help us think um, that we do need to make a better story, absolutely, about how we make some lives. I think that's a really critical message. And, and, and I agree that this challenge about what is the production of knowledge and how does that actually change things is something that many of us, also who are academics, really take quite seriously. Um, but then you also talked about, which was kind of a funny joke, but also true, that you never gotten so much money in your career as when you said no to money. It wasn't so I think that exactly that that's exactly where we have to start to think about well, how can we restructure the narrative to understand who can say no to money and when they can do that. And I really appreciate, I just also put it on Twitter, but this is one of the rare times when I actually hear an organized gathering on humanitarian issues that talks about racism, which I very much appreciate because this is something that we know, you know, is, is part of who structures, you know, who can say no to money. Um, and I also thought it was a really fantastic finding, and I'm looking forward to the upcoming reports that you mentioned, Katya, about this Indonesian example where the government insistence on working with a local partner it was actually a good model, even if it seemed different. And I wonder if we want to talk about, you know, the relationships that we have with government. I mean, regulation is often assumed to be a bad thing for civil society. And I think that this is a really difficult political thing to take up. 
But thinking about that is something that talks about intervening at a more structural level, right? Should we, should we have to choose local harbors or should that be a requirement? And if we think that maybe having that kind of a level playing field where everybody looks to the local partner isn't an unreasonable thing, how do we tell those stories to make that convincing to the loudest person? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Yeah. I, I, th I think on one side, we always underestimate the personal perspective, the, the, the role that individuals play in their social capital. I remember once talking to the head of civil protection in, in Zimbabwe, talking about flooding of the Zambezi and, and saying, you know, when, when we have flooding coming, we tried everything, we alert, we, we think when they open the gates, they need to tell Mozambique that the water is coming, right? And, and so he said, we tried everything, we couldn't figure out. So now what I do is I put on a tie, I go down to the Mozambican ambassador and I say <coughs> to him, water is coming your way. Right? And that's an incredibly sensible thing to do. And I don't think it's an exception. I think that probably happens a lot. And I think we, we, we don't work systematically with fostering a community of practice on an ecosystem on network of individuals who collaborate across the world and who, who can have tremendous power in short circuiting some of those institutional market failures, if you want, whatever that, that we have. I think that's one thing. And secondly, I think we get, need to get much smarter around how we think about humanitarian architecture. And the reason we use the word ecosystem is that you don't coordinate an ecosystem, right? You stock it with, you stock the lake with different species, you throw in some food and then you watch what happens. And then you, as a garden, you do a bit of weeding, a bit of watering. And so we have to, it, 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 there's a report from ODI called uh, Time to Let Go, I think it was called, right? And I always thought it's a great report. And, and Christina Bennett, who wrote it, is, is, is one of the clearest thinkers on this. But I always thought the title was wrong. It shouldn't be time to let go. It should be, this will now be taken away from you. <laughs> right? Because we're still in control if it's us from decide to let go. I mentioned Frank, who was delocalized. And we had a long conversation about localization. And, and one of the things we, when, uh, when we talked, one of the jokes was that maybe we should we talk so much about capacity building of local organizations. How do we decapacitate INGOs? What is it that we don't do if we are the INGOs? It, it, if you have the power, you will use it eventually. Yeah. But I think, right, I think that's really kind of the key issue here is the power structures. I mean, there's many examples of, you know, I think we're all pretty much in agreement with the good stuff around localization, but how to kind of, you know, change those power structures. I mean, for me, that's really, uh, I think that's what we work with every day in the localization task team and, and others. And for me, that, that's um, that, that's still a bit of a question for me, actually. <laughs> and I raised it in different ways a few times. So if, if somebody kind of uh, stumbles across how we do that, <laughs> then please, uh, yeah, let me know. But, yeah. but there are some good examples also, I guess, of, of how that could happen. I don't think it's hopeless, and I don't want to paint a picture where we're all just totally without agency. I think, I think every single person in this room has a lot of agency and a lot of space to influence and change things. But your day job may be in, con may be in conflict with that sometimes. And I think it's about calling that out, having an internal conversation about that, and then also connecting and, and leveraging the people you can to, to change things. Thanks very much. That's great. And thank you all for coming. Uh, those of you who sign up for this event will uh, get back to the Thank you very much to each of our panelists. Uh, incredibly smart, interesting, and inspiring presentation. So I'll leave it at that. And thank you very much for coming.